Hey, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Seth Miranda and I'm a pro photographer right here in New York City. You may have seen me on some other channels like Adorama TV, but I also have a Twitch channel where I invite some colleagues and peers and other photographers and just people I think have value information and just have a good time uh, live on my Twitch channel. So if you want to join the chat and ask us questions right there on the spot and be part of the conversation, join us at twitch.tv slash lastxwitness. But for now, just enjoy this chat. I'll see you later. I think this is the earliest we've ever streamed on this channel, but I had to bring on like a legit veteran, a guy who knows uh, an insane amount of light theory for a bunch of you photo nerds out there. This guy spun my head around when I saw him. I think it was at Photokina or somewhere. We were just talking about like NAB. Um, NAB and we were talking about like how to actually get correct color and color spectrum and lighting. And it was like the most nerded out thing I ever talked about in my life. And then you sent me a bunch of your videos, which were like next level, super awesome. And I even shared them in the Discord. Ladies and gentlemen, my buddy Ab from Sakonic. What's going on, man? Nothing much, man. Steph, thanks, thanks for having me, man. Oh, of course, bro. Are you kidding me? Like, this is what this channel is. And I showed everybody your work. Um, and I'm going to actually pull up your Instagram just to get people all psyched up about it. But um, I just want to say photo. Okay, cool. Let me pull this up. I'm going to share the screen and that way people can get a sense of you. Right now, we're just warming up the, the stream. We got a, you know, oh, we're actually got a bunch of people in the chat. Look at that. You're, you're a draw, bro. You're, you're a draw. Hey, good to know. Hang on. Let me uh, minimize all these uh, notepads that I have. Okay, screen share. Let's do that. Yeah. And just so you guys have an idea of who I'm talking to here, this guy is like what we in the industry call bananas. And, and this is my man right here. Uh, you should all hit follow on this guy. I'm going to put the link in the chat. What's going on? Photo G, Calibra, Jack Death. Everybody's in the chat. Let's just take a look. So Hi. really ultra clean lighting, very artistic aesthetics. This, I thought this series was just nuts. You're using the paper as yeah. the bounce from Phil, which was just perfect. And you just have a really clean aesthetic. You have a vision. You're slaying it. I mean, these are next level productions. A lot of the things you do, though, which I think are 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 like things that nobody would grasp onto. Mm -hmm. You're actually creating these shadow patterns half the time. You're actually creating these light patterns everywhere, not just on your model. And that's a big deal because a lot of people think like, oh, you just shot it with a window, but you may not have. Yeah, that that shot you just passed. We totally. We actually did a video on that shoot but it's uh basically layering a bunch of gel um mm -hmm. to come up with like these cool these cool patterns i could even you know even if you can share the screen i could even i can show you the rough edit of that too yeah if you want yeah sure let me go let me stop sharing my screen want me to one second let me let me pull that up but uh, <laughs> what i thought was great is you know we see a lot of videos that are like cookie cutter stuff right like here's mm -hmm. how you do this type of lighting but when i watch your videos you're kind of like here's how we're doing this and here's the science of it and now it's up to you to get your own feel of it no thank you yeah i like to spend a lot of time looking at light that i see like you know if you go out like early morning when the sun's moving um, even my own apartment, like when lights coming through, I like to just see how it naturally bounces off of things. And one second, I'm trying to find this. No video. problem. I mean, he's got his home studio right behind him. If you notice it's a textured background, it's not plain paper. Uh, I mean, it's, it's got a, it, everything that you do has like this, uh, aesthetic. It's not just like a, let's see what we can do. You can totally see that you approached it with a method. You approached it with some sort of goal in mind a little bit no thank you yeah, i mean I, I look i look to everyone like yourself for inspiration every photographer out there there's a lot of people who say you know i don't like to look at other photographers work you know i feel like it could influence what i'm doing and i think that ultimately you have to build a muscle where you can push through that you know because mm -hmm. you need to understand that you're going to constantly be influenced anyway and to recognize what you're influenced by, A, you're going to start to learn the things that you react to, that you're attracted to, which is going to kind of almost help you build your own personal style. Um, and you're going to come up with questions to ask people so you can keep learning. I mean, photographers, 
who stop learning, who feel like they they know it all, um, those are the ones that retire early. <laughs> yeah, <You know? laughs> it's, it's, you know. I, I feel like those are the ones that get stagnant and stuck. And then when you get bored with your own work and you just keep on regurgitating it, mm -hmm. it's, it's like I do it with the FX work. I'm like, I'm super tired of doing cold rim lights, but mm -hmm. I'll still keep doing cold rim lights. <laughs> like it's what it is. But there's mm -hmm. a lot of photographers that will only get um, inspiration or influence from like paintings or other mediums. And you can kind of see that, that they're not going by like the light theory. They're going more by like the color and, you know, mm -hmm. gesture and stuff like that. But in your work, I can totally see that you're paying attention to theory the way light works and what you can do with the light that will work for what you're shooting. Absolutely. Because um, as, as much as I like, so quick question, I can, how do I share my screen? Go to the bottom and you see where it says that green, that green thing on the bottom of our window. It says screen oh, share. It, yep. Yeah. And it'll ask me what screen I want. So hopefully yeah. it plays audio. If it doesn't play audio, then we'll- It probably we'll... won't. It probably won't play audio. You can talk over it though. Okay, no, maybe if it plays on my speakers and then it picks up. God, I'm trying to figure out a way. One second, let me. Close. Well, how about we put the link in the in the chat? That's one start. It's, it's right? a frame IO, so it's something that uh, no one can. Um... Well, would you want to just screen share it and narrate a little bit? So. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Good idea. No one's seen this before, an exclusive. Oh man, I'm gonna start blushing. Okay. All right, what are we looking at? Oh. Do you hear it? I hear it from your speakers as subtly, very subtly. Yeah, I saw the video of that, the the one with the, the mixed color gels with the neutral center. Mm -hmm. And I definitely shared that with a Discord somewhere. Wow, look at this setup. Wow, In this video, we're going to show you how to recreate a sunset look in the studio. So replicating that last 15 minutes of sunset right before it dips below the horizon after a rainstorm The inspiration wow. came from many late nights working in studio and wow. seeing that warm glow on the studio wall right before Yeah, the audio is kind of trashed up, man. So I, I can talk through it. Um, yeah, let's do that. So, so basically what, what we did here is I was trying to replicate um, the light. Can you light pause it so we can see the setup? All right, one second. Well, I, I can go back. Cool. So the concept here was, you know, and again, the inspiration for this shot came from working like in studios, like late night. And yeah. you kind of get to that point where it's magic hour. And, you know, you're there doing some, let's say, boring catalog shoot, you know, getting through 100 looks. And the next thing you know, like this beautiful light breaks through the window. And you mm -hmm. kind of want to stop and shoot it, but you can't can't because you have a client there. Um, and so therefore, I asked, you know, I was thinking like, how can I recreate the look of a sunset so that I could extend magic hour as long as I wanted to? Are you and, bouncing a CTB off the ceiling on the right? Yeah. Because wow. what happens is, the, you know, when during sunset, you kind of have two lights you have the direct sunlight that's coming, which is usually like this very orange ochre um, type of light. And then mm -hmm. you have all this blue that's being kicked back in from the sky. Mm. And so what you, what you want to do is your direct light, I'm gelling it really, really warm, but our, I need to kind of reproduce the fill light so it kind of looks like it's not coming from anywhere. So I have like a blue gel that's like bouncing off the ceiling that provides the fill for the shot. And so, so is this a mix of constant and strobe? What are we doing here? This is all strobe. Okay. So this here, can you see my mouse? Yeah. So that's a, that's a focusing spotlight. I have one of those. That's got a head in it though. Is that a pro photo head in the back of it? Yes. So okay. Ellen, Ellen Chrome used to make a 18 to 36 um, focus spot. Um, and previous to this, Profoto made uh, like a, this beast of like a focus spot. Um, this Ellen Chrome one, between you and I, I think is like a treasure because to, to get something that basically allows you to kind of use light like it's a laser, you know? Yeah. It's, it's super directional. And when you have light that's super directional, you can do anything you want with it um, in terms of like cutting it, blocking it. And so... 
and defining patterns. That's another big thing is you can't always do that. Yes, because the, the, the thing that the sun has is there's so much distance that it comes and it's very direct. And so when you're trying to replicate sunlight, you want light that's highly, 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 highly directional mm. um, so that the shadows that it leaves look realistic. Um, and and it's, the direction it's coming from is like very clear. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll play a little bit more. And so the concept behind here is over here where we have the model, this was, you know, kind of that corner in a studio where you just see like a lot of equipment. Um, and then over here, I'm going to talk about all the different gels that we use kind of to get like this kind of warehouse. If I can get back to the shot. So like, Look yeah, you're going to see I, what I do is I start to layer the gels so you get this gradient of color. Okay. And that would be very hard to do, impossible to do if you didn't have a spotlight. Yeah, I mean, pretty uh, much. Uh, it would actually, because the light's spreading so, uh, it's actually physically spreading, it'll yep. meld. It won't actually cause a gradation of separating the tones. It'll actually just become one mix of a tone. Yep. So, but you see how the top edge of the shadow has that blue tinge? Is that the CTB hitting? No, so that this blue tinge that you see here is the, the giveaway. That's chromatic uh, aberration. Got it. And got so it. The, the lenses that are used in most focus spots, you know, the quality of lens it would take to completely eliminate chromatic aberration, they'd be horribly expensive. Right. Um, and so the lenses that they use, oftentimes you get this um, chromatic aberration, which like in a shot like this, we <clears throat> intentionally... Yeah reduced we, we intentionally don't have any props or wardrobe here that has mm -hmm. a blue that matters so that in post if we want to we can suck select some of it. that blue out yeah you can select it uh and what just so the chat knows the lens he's talking about is the lens on the focusing spotlight uh yeah. it's that's the light that's being shot through and that's what's causing the causing the aberration it's not the lens in to the camera that's receiving the light and causing the operation. Uh, if there was glass with that fidelity, that attachment would be ridiculous. I, I use a, an Altman focusing spotlight that was rewired for Speedatron. It, it basically electrocutes me. This thing is so built to like just out of machine parts, uh, mm -hmm. but it's awesome. You know, this is actually geared for this um, and putting a strobe through, it gives you ridiculous control on exposure mixed with the control on shadow patterns, definition, spread, and also gaining of exposure from the magnification. Definitely. And, and, and so just so you know, there are constant lights that work. I, I didn't answer that correctly. You, they're, they're kind of here as part mm -hmm. of our set. Yeah. And Those are just practicals, right? They're just there to be practical, not actually you as an exposure source. But they, they are giving us some separation here. If you look on the model's arm oh, and on yeah. the leg. So they're giving yeah. us a little bit, but not a lot. This is this is mostly just a two light shot. Mm. Man, what a nut! What a, and people would just assume that you just found a studio that had these windows that created this, and it's like, oh, he just clicked a button. And yet, the real beauty of this is that you're able to create this wherever, whenever you want, which is what a client needs. Absolutely. How many gels did you stack on that key light? We stacked. Let me get to a close. Is that three? There are, I'm trying to see if I have a clear, okay. Is that, so wait a second, is that all CTOs? What are they? No, they're not CTOs. So they're, what's going on is I have um, CTO, I have CTS, and then I have Amber. And so I use the CTO to overall change the color temperature. Mm-hmm. Then I use CTS. CTS stands for um, like color, color temperature, temperature straw. straw. Yeah. And so it's yeah. more yellow and it's going to give me more of like kind of like a yellow gold look. Okay. Um, and then here I have an amber and the amber um, gives you more of what that sunset looks like. You know, if you've ever studied the light at sunset, it's it's not just warmer, it actually starts to go way more red as well. And so you get like this amber um, 
you get this amber color that that starts to happen that I wanted to to replicate. And I was also hoping that by using so many gels, I can also start to pull out some of that blue from the chromatic aberration. It, oh, really? It ends up reducing it just not a lot, but just a touch, especially okay. compared to the blue that I'm shooting up into the ceiling. Um, so that, you know, so the images you're looking at right now aren't retouched. Yeah. That, yeah. You, this is like still a rough edit. So when the final, when we retouch the final images, you know, I'm, the chromatic aberration is going to be one of those things that I, I try to hide. Well, so what about this broken up clear? You're doing that to basically diffuse and shatter the light around? Yeah, I, I don't want the light to look too perfect. And so I was thinking of, you know, have you ever been in like an old factory building where like yeah. they cover the windows with that, that insulation plastic to keep some right. in? And so the concept behind this plastic was basically um, like torn up insulation from like an old factory window. So and that when the light shoots through, it's not like through a plate clean glass. It actually feels organic through something. Yeah, it muddies it up a little bit. Right. And it, it kills the top edge too, so that there's not like this hard top edge. Because, mm. um, you know, the, studying light, like especially early in the morning and late at night and seeing like what it looks like when it's passing through different things, when it's re like light, the light that reflects off a building sometimes is just gorgeous, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's taking the properties of what it's reflecting off of while it's also taking the properties of the sun when it's setting, gets warmer, you know, all sorts of things. And that's yep. kind of what makes us photographers is not just pointing a light at something and hoping something goes down, but, you know, actually being these light technicians, the fact that you could create this look at any time means that when you get a call from a client that says, like, we want to make it look like it's sunset through a warehouse window, they don't have to look for a set. They don't have to go scouting. They don't have to need a time of day, a small 30 minute window to get the shot. You can do it whenever, wherever. And they just saved a bunch of money and scheduling time. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So, uh, small field Tom is asking, how much light would you lose when you're using that amount of gels? Um, you're going to lose, I'm probably losing about two, three. Uh, so all the, so the part so here, this is a good example. Um, I would say on my brightest part of the exposure, like kind of up here behind her head, yeah. I'm probably losing about maybe one and a half to two stops there. By wow. the time I get down here, I'm probably losing about three, about three stops. So where do you meet her? So where do you usually go for it? Just like where their face is going to be and just let it fall where it's going to fall? Um, in meter in this shot, I metered her face. Okay. And then I also want to make sure there wasn't too much fall off. So I, I metered kind of like up and down. I metered the hot lights to make sure that they weren't burning in too much. And then I also metered, I kind of metered, this one's difficult. because I was trying to give her direction where she had to keep her face so that this line never like got right in her face. Gotcha. And so if you see on the floor, you see these marks. Mm. And so we had to make sure that she always kind of like hit these marks, especially when we wanted poses like this, where there was like some movement. Um, and so then when I metered the background, I would meet her kind of down here all the way up. But the ratio mm. I was most concerned with was actually metering this shadow here. Whoa, I was, really? Yeah, because that's it's difficult to see on this screen, but that's where the blue from the ceiling starts to kick in. Interesting. And I want to make sure that that ratio stays somewhat realistic. You know, see, that's what's funny is because if you didn't have that CTV bouncing off the ceiling, in theory, you would have some dense black shadows going on there, huh? Very. There'd be almost pure black. So your fill light is just a blue CTV correction gel while you're shooting you're basically so you're set in white balance of like daylight but you're creating your sunset golden hour and because you're still in white light you're shooting the shadows to come up with a blue cold light even though um you're shooting in natural tone correct see that's what's up that is what is up see this is actual light theory kids and that's what I think we're missing these days and to be able to shoot at this level to create the light at this level means you paid attention to light you paid attention to what organic light looks like. So when you create artificial 
you actually know what it should look like, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I love you. I was like, uh -huh. every time I say so, he was like, yeah, yeah, that, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so here, actually, this is a good shot. Where here, oh, sick. You can see the effect when I was playing with the plastic. That's dope. And you could do anything with this in theory. You could actually keep playing with this to make a denser uh, clear and actually make it look like it's a thunderstorm if you wanted to get that cold purple light if you needed you know mm -hmm. I oh mean, absolutely there's, there's... like you know i would it, to make a thunderstorm what i would do is i would play with like a piece of plexi in front and then see what it looks like if i started plexi. spraying water drops on it like i would get plexi. clear plexi put that in front and then i would hit it with water drops and see if the water yeah. drops looked real and if the water yeah. drops didn't look real then i would i would say you know what let me look like let me see what it looks like if i like tape piece of paper that look like water drops and tape like paper drips and see if those mm -hmm. shadows translate into anything on the background that make it feel more like it was raining outside, like you just said. So crazy, crazy, but why couldn't we just take a piece of plexi and just glue down these gels in a gradation pattern and that way we have this one plate that's saved or hey, maybe you guys at the Mac group could actually make this, like make a mm -hmm. giant plexi that use sunsets you know ab sunset <laughs> yeah I, I thought about that and when when we were doing the shot one of the things that we like to do in these videos i wonder if i have it here is to do a build up so the question in the chat right now is asking the temperature changes you're creating did you just do this by a feeling or was there some sort of measurement process because i do it on pure feeling mm -hmm. and half the time i'm totally wrong so you just <laughs> you let me know Oh, I, I did it based upon, um, I, we, one of the meters that we, so side note, I worked with Sakonic and one of the meters that we make is a C800. So I actually saved meter readings from what I was getting during sunset, you know, oh. like di directly at the sun. You pointing. fucking nerd. You fucking <laughs> did you have to, <laughs> I, I geek out on this shit, man. I could do this like all day long. Well, can we, do you have the C800 on you right now? I do. Uh, yeah, can we just take a look at that really quick? Do turn off the screen sharing for a second? So I just oh, yeah. want them to get an idea of what this, what a meter, because I, me and Daniel get asked all the time, what do I need a light meter for? I never use one. I can just look at my camera and see, but this is really where it gets nuts. You're measuring your shadow. You're measuring your highlight. You're measuring what each gel is doing. You're trying to figure out where your uh, constant lights are falling so they don't blow out. You're trying to see the density of your shadows, all sorts of stuff like that. But without mm -hmm. a light meter, you're really just kind of, playing games until you get an actual measurement. You actually went into the organic light and took measurements of the temperature so that when you went into the studio to recreate it, you had those temperatures. Yeah. Cause it, it's like, it's going to be those little subliminal things that help you make the shot look a little bit more real. Yeah. You know? yeah and when so, they stop wondering if it's fake, that's when you got it. Mm -hmm. And like how you saw, like the first thing you saw is you saw like those blue, like kind of the blue chromatic aberration. Yeah. You know, that's the stuff that, you know, as I, as I start to tweak this, that I want to start to, to understand and get rid of. Mm -hmm. And so that with the C100, basically what it does is it tells me like the spectral fingerprint of any light source that we like. So in this case, you know, I found out the color temperature, but also the spectral quality, which you can kind of see in this graph here, which kind of shows you, Jesus. you know, Kind of the, the the ingredients that the lights made up of um and then i get into the studio and i try to replicate that as best i can um because it, it is you know a lot of people say that they don't need a, a meter you know yeah. and i can agree with them that they they don't need one you know because they're already doing what they're doing you know and you know i compare it to a lot of people have like a circular, what, what is it? Like a circular polarizer. Yeah. My circular polarizer probably comes out of my bag maybe twice a year. But when I need it, I really, really need it. The shot that, that I'm showing, that I just showed you with the, the sunset, that shot's only two lights. But what I do is if I get a client who comes back and they say, you know what, we want to we wanna do that. I want to be able to dial it in as quickly as humanly possible. That's the thing. You know, That's and the if, thing. 
you know, and if I have a problem, like when I'm looking at the model, let's say I'm going to pull up this shot really quick. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show so that we can talk over it because I think this is what you're talking about. The one that I had on your Instagram. So let me uh, share it. This this uh -huh. one right here. Yes. Yes. So that that was a version. Um, and so one of the things I changed was once I studied things a little bit more, I actually realized that in this one, you see how I start the, the gradient at the top of the picture. Mm -hmm. When I was looking at things in nature happening, I realized that it actually starts at the bottom. You know, and so oh. I, flipped, I flipped it <clears throat> from, from this, but this shot here. So when I'm testing with models, one of the things that I'm looking to do is proof of concept of new ideas. I'm not just looking to get models for the pictures, you know, pictures for the model. I'm trying to test out something new that then I can keep massaging and massaging. So this is, I, I probably, I've set this setup up, up about, let's say four different times. And each time I've changed something, the fact that I was using a meter allows me to kind of set back up where I left off before. That's and it. And then <clears throat> keep tweaking from there. You know, and who's and, to say you couldn't set this up for like, let's say a still life and you need to do a product shot that looked like it was like a shampoo bottle on a windowsill or something. You could do it because you're already done it. There's another trick in your Rolodex of cards, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is fucking crazy, man. I, we should, we got to do this. Let me get, get into my studio and let's do this. Done. Fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. But I think, um, what people don't realize is that we've lost the art of precision. Sometimes we've lost this whole idea that you don't have to keep on moving a light till you get it. You can actually go in there knowing what you're doing and also replicate it because you know what actually happened, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, not, yeah. I think a lot of teachers, you know, not a lot of teachers, but some teachers are doing a, a bad job because, you know, I, when people are teaching like about metering, I feel like either they're, they're teaching it very like militaristic where it's like, okay, you need to understand lighting ratios or they're just like, don't use one at all and just keep <laughs> adjusting things in the camera. And yeah. if, you know, once you're shooting with a big team, like Seth, I'm sure you know, like you're, you have, especially with you, I mean, you have such extensive makeup when you're shooting, there's so much going on that the last thing you want is someone's been in a chair for, an hour getting their makeup done, getting their hair done, getting dressed. The moment they step in front of your camera, you have two options, right? Either you're gonna have that wow moment or you're gonna tell everyone to wait till you can get to the wow moment. And so mm -hmm. if the first picture I take after the, the subject sits down looks amazing, their confidence is immediately boosted, their trust in you is boosted, everybody around you is just like, wow, that, you know, like you, you've seen it where the first picture next to, you know, everyone, hair, makeup, everyone's complimenting the model. Everyone's complimenting each other. You've just all, automatically taken your shoot to another level. You know, do you need yeah. a meter to do that? No, you don't need a meter to do that, but you need to make sure the first shot you get out of your camera looks amazing. You know, if the first shot you take, you take it, and then you're like, hold on one second. Let me fix this. They're trying to figure out, do I look ugly? What does he not like? <laughs> the makeup artist is like, well, let me see the makeup. Is the makeup good? The hairstyle is like, let me see the hair. Is the hair good? When the first shot comes out money, yeah, you, you've automatically, you're going to get better pictures because everyone's just in it more. You know, they're more invested yeah. at that point. I, yeah. Um, in my world, the models don't feel like themselves already. They don't mm -hmm. feel like they're beautiful sometimes. I mean, they're bleeding zombie alien creatures and whatever mm -hmm. else. So they don't feel like that. They also are like exhausted from four hours of makeup and everybody's groggy or whatever. Or half the time I lost the entire day because they took so long with the makeup. I only have this small window. Mm -hmm. So if I, I think you can agree that while you don't need the precision off the bat, if you don't have a feel for your equipment to know that this will hit like this, I know F8 here. I know, I mean, Vanessa Joy visited me at, on a Makeup Forever set and mm -hmm. I was shooting injury and the right away I was like, bang, bang, bang. And she's like, 
did you use TTL? I'm like, no, I just know that three and a half feet is 7.5 in that light. And I know that this will be that. And I know this soft box eats up this much light. Once you get to know your equipment, you can fly, but there's no faster way to know your equipment than seeing actual measurements. Yeah. To not have an instrument as a photographer that creates their own light, that measures what you're doing is insane to me, even if you use it once a year. Mm. I don't get it, man. Like, I, and I also think that, because speaking of education, when you tell people about lighting and they go, oh, but you also have to spend like another couple hundred bucks on a meter, they go, oh, enough. Like, I already bought this. I bought that thing. Mm. Now this why and if they don't use it enough they feel like they didn't they didn't spend the money right or whatever but i guess you're mm -hmm. right that people don't teach it correctly don't you have a set of videos out there where can they find your videos we have videos on Saconic's youtube channel Saconic's, is, okay i think just youtube.com slash Saconic. i'm gonna and put it in the a, chat a new series we're coming up with called the formula in which basically it's like a cooking show and <laughs> we're, we're doing a shot and then we're telling you what everything measured, you know? And I, I think meters actually even become more important if, if distance learning comes into play, because now you're gonna be able to have someone work with you and repeat what you're doing, even yeah. if they don't have the same lights, even if they don't have the same location. You know, like I know if I'm trying to reset this shot up, the first see. thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to dial things in based upon what my meter gave me. And then I'm going to start to see what I can't change. Like, I'm going to start to see like, you know what? The ceiling's just too low and I can't control the field properly, you know? And- Oh, it's Saconic Vids. Saconic, oh, Saconic Vids. Vids. Yeah, yeah. They just fixed okay. it. That's how good the chat is. They went and found the right link for us. That's amazing. This is like an amazing <laughs> group of people, man. Thanks so much. No, nah, and you're welcome to stay in the Discord with us and share some work and share your videos. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you check the Discord out? Did I send you a thing to that? The I chat did not. room thing? Okay, I'll, I'll get you in there after we're out of here. But mm -hmm. um, that way people can stay in touch with your videos and everything. And honestly, I don't think anybody talks about light theory, man. Like it just, it's so irritating to me that we just think of like, oh, throw it in high speed sync, done. Oh, throw it mm -hmm. in TTL, done. It's like, yeah, the, the equipment can work for us, obviously. But like, don't you want to have your own ability to build something? You know, like I would kill to be, on like the Saconic channel over something else. Like I think the, the street cred among peers is so nuts. And what's more credible than creating anything, anything. We got to have you on there. I'll be on there. Two seconds. I'll be on there. You're right. in New York. Aren't, isn't Saconic in New York? We are. Yes. Westchester. Yeah, dude. I'll, yeah. When I can actually leave this apartment, I will totally get over there. <laughs> I, noticed that. I like oh, the light, man. by the way. Thanks. I, like I uh, yeah, they're uh, it's so I don't know about you, but do you carry do you carry these the the swatch books? I have that one, yes. Yeah, I have the big fat one too. Have you ever seen the fat one? Oh no! Oh, here it is. This one actually is big enough. I I usually rip them apart and put them on speed lights. Ooh, no! So I have next, every one. Next time we see each other, bring that. I'll borrow. I'm sorry, it I can't you. hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> I think I need to borrow that one. No, that's super handy. Do you, do you want to explain to, uh, cause I, I try to explain it, but like, you're like an actual like guy at this. What exactly are these graphs about? These are the so, light transmission, how much you lose, right? Those are telling us what, can you just tell me what the scale is, is measuring? It's, it's, it, at, it, it's it, nanometers. It is nanometers. Yep. Nanometers. So what, what that is, it's showing you the spectral distribution information and so all the way on the left hand side you're going to see ultraviolet light and then on the right hand side you're starting to get towards infrared and so what what they're doing is they're basically showing you um possibly they're probably saying if you take this gel and hold it up to daylight this is how it's going to change the spectrum. So it's called a SPD graph, which basically stands for spectral power distribution. And it's basically telling you how much red, green, blue, yellow, mm. and red is in there and how it's going to affect it. So here's a, actually the C800, I can kind of give you guys a visual of what that means. 
Also, just so you guys in the chat know, that light meter will tell you exactly what gel to use, like what number gel to plug in for whatever you're trying to do. Yep. So this graph right here basically is it's just another version of that graph you were showing me. And you know, if I took a reading of daylight, which is give me two seconds. I'm gonna take a measurement of daylight real quick. I got <laughs> Yeah, go do it. All right. <laughs> Look, this is how real this is. This guy's about to go measure legit sunlight for you guys to give you a spectrum of what's going on in actual natural light. This guy is the man. These are the people you don't hear about, I swear. All these fucking influencers, and this is the real deal. Come on, man. From technical to vision, this guy's got it nailed. Unreal. Unfucking believable. How are you guys doing in the chat, by the way? Everybody safe? Everybody healthy? Let me know how you're going. How's everything going out there? And uh, don't forget to follow Ab and his uh, Instagram. Oh, here he comes. So this here is what daylight looks like. God damn. Look at that spectrum. Beautiful. And so usually when those, when they show you that, those graphs on gels, there'll be a, what they call like a reference illuminant which will either be like tungsten or it'll be like daylight. And then it's showing you how this graph is going to get altered once that gel is applied to it. Got it. Okay, so that's interesting. I mean, these are what light like, technicians do. This is what these guys, I remember when I was on set for, um, was it Ikea? Uh, Luna Lighting here in Brooklyn. That guy, mm -hmm. every three seconds was like, I mean, by the inch down the set to let me know where I was going to lose light, how I was going to shift. And it made a difference if you, but what do you think about being overloaded with too much data and getting your head out of the shot in an aesthetic way? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it comes with. Put your mic on. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> he's, he's still new at live streaming kids. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I got to get back up here with my, my little mics. The, the question was, um, how do I think about getting overloaded with too much technical stuff? Yeah. Um, I, I think you should definitely know your limits in terms of what you can handle um, before it becomes like a distraction. And then I think ultimately you have to find, you have to find the balance based upon what you need to do, you know? And so if you're a photographer who's developed a particular style, right? and your client's coming to you and they're just like, we want you to do your thing. You know, like we want you to do that thing that you do. I'm more of a commercial photographer, meaning oftentimes people come to me with a mood board that will include some of my work, but mostly the work from other people and inspiration from like everywhere. And I need to know what equipment we're gonna need and what techniques we're gonna need to achieve that. You know, and for so, for instance, you know, people ask like someone may ask a question like um, I hear a lot. They're like, what aperture was that shot at? And you'll be let's say I say, well, this was shot at five, six. And they're like, well, why did you shoot that at five, six? Wouldn't F11 be sharper? And then sometimes the response is, well, I was shooting with a battery powered light at five, six. I was going to get 500 more flashes. And. I didn't want to go to ISO whatever. I wanted to stay at ISO 100 because I know that's the cleanest. And so that's why I ended up shooting at 5.6 because I had to shoot all day on one battery and I just didn't have the juice to get to like F-16. Yeah. You know? You're talking and to a speed light guy. You know what I went through over the years when it was all double A batteries? That was all about conserving power and trying to get the most you can out of everything and yep. you know, trying to make light that's this big look like it's this big and you mm -hmm. need more power for that and then you're counting shots you know and then you're like you know it doesn't matter what my settings are if i can't shoot yep so. and, and what you just said super is super important is when you're in that process of counting shots you are you're you're no longer in the moment you know like i i use like have you ever shot a wedding on film way way back so when I first started shooting, I had to shoot weddings on film. And when you had the first fresh oh, wait, yeah, roll, did, did one wedding on film. I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> when, when you put the first fresh roll of film in, you were super creative. You know, like you just because you knew you had these 36 other shots. By the <laughs> time you got to shot 30, you're like, no, I'm not going to shoot that. No, I'm not going to shoot that. No, I think I'm going to wait and not shoot that. 
or let me like you started holding back based upon like the technology, you know, or you're like, you know what, let me just shoot these five shots really quick. You have five of the same thing just so you can put another roll in to be prepared for possibly what the next shot was, you know, yeah. especially if you just had one camera to work with. Um, I remember that was Canon EOS three. I was, I was. You're a Canon guy. I prefer Canon because I feel like it's the easiest to rent. I feel like. <laughs> wow, that was the first on the list. <laughs> I, I feel like the fact that their lenses have been, you know, adopted by Panasonic to some degree. They've been adopted yeah. by other video camera manufacturers. Um, it's pretty, and you know, so nobody else has given me a reason to change. I, I do love Sony. Um, really? I think the, what is it? The, the Sony a7R2. Uh -huh. I think the file out of that camera is unbelievable. Have you like, seen the D850? The Nikon D50? 850. 850? Yeah, the D850 from Nikon. That's what I shoot with. That's what everything you've seen I, probably from me came I, from. I've heard everyone loves the files. I've, I've shot with it, but I can't say I remember like the file quality that much. You know what I think you should be shooting with? And I'm not trying to like infect your brain or whatever, uh -huh. but the Fuji GFX 100. I've heard was one of the craziest fucking cameras. And if there's one type of photography that it should go for, it's exactly what you're doing. High detail, full shots of people, the skin tech. Uh, oh God, it was so fucking good. But it, I mean, it's 10 grand, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, it's a, I would love to use it. I, I would probably say that though, I have a bad habit now. And I just realized it. Cause I, I just rented the Sony a seven R four. Mm -hmm. For stills, and quite honestly, I still prefer the file over the, you know, the other two. My problem was for a lot of stuff that I shoot, especially when I'm just testing, it was just too much. Really? So the, like the, the amount of data was just too much. So commercially, I'd love to use it. Um, for when I'm, when I'm doing test shoots, it was, for me, it was just overkill. Um, but I would definitely rent it depending on the application. You know, yeah, like how many I times would... have you done? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, how many times have you done a test shoot and then gotten to a zone where you're like, the shot is actually better than something you would do for a job? Like there's so many, st there's so much of my stuff that started out as just like, let me try this. And mm -hmm. now I'm like, oh, this is awesome. And you go and do it again commercially. And you're kind of like, I mean, you're kind of over it. You're not like as psyched up as you were during the test. And somehow the test shots are the hero shots. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I think that goes to that, that energy, man. Like sometimes you're just, the te the, you're, you're just in the moment. And I think that's when the shots are the best. And, and, you know, the lighting is part of it, but the direction, the model, like hair, makeup, all, you know, everything plays a role in the shot. You need a right team. It, it, it's so mm -hmm. easy to have someone on your team or something you're using become more of a friction point and, it slows you down, doesn't give you what you wanted. You're doing something to correct or go against it to balance out what you're trying to do. And mm -hmm. that's the worst. I don't know about you, but that's like, to me, it gets my like, it, it's, I feel like someone punched me in the back while I'm trying to get this job done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, and, and I think also when people, in terms of like technology becoming a barrier, like how much can you handle is like, also, you know, I feel like some photographers, that's the part of this that they like. And I feel like some people, that's the part of it that they hate. You know, yeah. like I was, I was on set um, when Annie Leibovitz was shooting the president of Pro Photo back in the day. You know, what? And you know, she just has a team of people who are like reading her mind the whole time, literally. And she was so focused. She was one hundred percent focused just on the creative part. And her team already knew what based upon where she was shooting, like how far the subject was from the background, where they were positioned, they kind of already knew aesthetically like how they wanted her to look. And, it, and it's actually a funny story because she's shooting the president pro photo. So of course she's, you know, they're like, okay, you know, we should use all pro photo lights. Halfway through the shoot, they said, you know what? We got to go back to what we know. So they, they put on the Fotec the little Fotec um, soft lighter. lighter. Yeah. They use the Ellen Chrome um, seven foot Octa. Um, well, that thing is amazing. You, uh, the Rotolux. The Rotolux, yeah. Yeah. I have one in my closet. And <laughs> they, 
<laughs> they went back to that because there are little nuances. You know, so for instance, they use like the Fotex soft lighter. The reason a lot of people like using it is due to the fact that it's so narrow. And, you know, and so she started out with a three foot octa, but she was pushed up against the wall. And then her, the light was in front of her kind of above camera. And then the subject was here and she wanted her assistant to pull the light back. But due to the fact that three foot octa had a depth of probably like a foot and a half, there was a foot that he couldn't pull it back. So they went mm. to the Fotex soft lighter for the simple fact that allowed them to get the light back more, you yeah. know, or like, you know, if you're familiar with like the, the, the older pro photo giant, um, giant like parabolics. Yeah. Th oh, those are expensive as hell. They're super oh, expensive. Man. <laughs> and the, light, the light that comes out of them is amazing. Yeah. Um, but that's a, that's a few grand. Yep. But they have this huge pole that comes out of the back. Wait, let me see and, if I can find it online. Hold got on. it. But basically, they have this it. huge pole that comes out of the back. And the reason oh, she is. stopped using it is because the pole, not because she didn't like the light quality, it was because the light just didn't fit the same place that the Ellen Chrome did. And well, they were already that. used to using the Ellen Chrome. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes you, so I actually stopped the shoot with full on mm -hmm. studio strobes and went back to speed lights, which drove some people on my set crazy, but I knew mm -hmm. what those lights were, would do. And I didn't have to like guess things. And I wasn't, I also wasn't so proficient with big light. So mm -hmm. I get, you get to your comfort zone. So this is the light we're talking about though, by the way, this is the giant parabolic yep. right here. This ginormous beast. Look at this thing, but you could focus it. And it was, it was just like, um, how do you put it? It's like, it's clean. I don't know how else to put it except clean. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it, it's, it's highly, highly, highly specular and very directional without being too hard because it's so big. You still get a tremendous amount of wraparound. Mm. So like the, it's, you know, so if you look at the, the inside of it, like each one of those, sections each one of those sections is a sorry this that's something. all good each one of those sections is like a different light so literally when you're lighting with it you know every area between those spokes almost turns into like its own light and it just kind of like homogenizes and if you shoot like full length like fitness and stuff like that with these i mean skin just looks amazing well, that's what people think that a lot of the fitness stuff is just like a direct hard light, but it's controlled hard light. That's why I see a lot of focusing parabolics and things because you're creating a large light source that's also hard. So it can actually cover area and it doesn't give you this like stagnant contrast. It gives you the texture contrast, which is interesting. But mm -hmm. you know what I always wanted to try with these and maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it won't even do anything. But if we cut gels for each one of these little triangles and mm -hmm. we did a gradation of temperature not color, but temperature, I think we could do some pretty cool shit, so. Mm. What do you think? It, it'll meld, right? It'll be kind of like, nah. Um, my guess is that most likely it'll just meld together and you'll just get one color temperature coming out of it. Yeah. Um, but you could get some really cool catch light. Oh, that's interesting. You know so maybe like a really tight shot. Yeah, you know, you you... You never know until you try it, you know? Yeah, I'll just get a few thousand dollars and some glue from a dollar store <laughs> and <laughs> I'll just wreck this light. But I mean, when people always ask me and Daniel, it's like, uh -huh. why would I spend this much money on this when an umbrella, you know, when this softbox costs like $5? Why would I spend this much money on this kind of light modifier when this, because cause there's something that happens. And I think one of the things that we can agree on is mm -hmm. subtleties matter. And when Absolutely. you notice the subtle changes in the light, that's what makes the difference. You know, that one modifier that's a lot of money, but it gets rid of the shadow on the glasses casting on someone's face, but still gives you the same quality is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and sometimes it, it's, it's not even how the light modifier works when you're using it. It's how does it pack up when you're not using it? How quickly can you set it up? Oh, interesting. You know, those are other things where it's just like, you know what, I'm going to buy this version because... You know, I know that like the Ellen Chrome soft boxes, they were real popular early on, even before they had like a grid option because they, they, they had a collapsible speed ring. 
and a lot of other people you had to always like you know put each spoke in and a beginning assistant putting a soft box together where you had to like put all the spokes in especially on the octa individually was a nightmare the 16 and spoke ones were the nightmare here you know you're, they're jabbing you and you look like an idiot trying to put it together you know it's almost like you want to keep it set up because and then, you know, someone comes over like, oh, let me help you with that. I have a technique. And they realize, oh, that, that shit doesn't work either, you know? And so, you know, some equipment is just like, you know what? I'm going to choose this one because I can set it up like in a matter of a second, you know? Man, or, I, or set it up, break down, set it up, break down, you know? So, so do you think that's the time is money theory? Do you think that's kind of what it is too? Yeah, I think time is money. And then I also think that in, in terms of access, you know, if I'm, let's say if I'm shooting in a subway and I'm walking around with this big set up soft box, like mm. I'm, I'm telling everyone, look at me, I'm about to take pictures. If I have a collapsible soft box that I can just pop open, shoot, 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 you know, collapse it again and then go on about my day. Um, it's going to draw far less attention to myself or, you know, oh. yeah, it's, it's true. And that's kind of the, one of the reasons, uh, I was hardcore on speed lights for most of my career was mm -hmm. I could sneak them into spots. No one even knows I'm shooting yet. And then we get going and I have like 10, 15 minutes. We got the shot. We can roll out or the fact. So I don't know where you fall on this, but like for me, smaller lights meant I have more points of source, not just a source. So I could actually mm -hmm. separate things like this, right? Zone one, zone two, I could keep on putting lights all over the place and really dial in everything. And I think that's how I got psychotic about like making every sh exposure the way I wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, do you kind of agree with that? Like having more points of source is sometimes better than having like a monster power of one light or maybe, or. I, I think having multiple lights, you're almost always guaranteed that a, you can turn them into a bigger source if you want. And, you know, saying what you said again is it, it, it ultimately gives you more control. You know, like if you have to go in and light an interior and you just have one big light source, then normally you, you start spending time cutting that light source, um, trying to break it up so you can get more out of it, you know? But when yeah. you have multiple lights to work with, I think you simply, it gives you more control and you can you can still make them act like a single source. It's true. You know, yeah, and, the multi brackets and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I, I think it, it really just, you know, there's so many factors that come into play when choosing gear, you know, and I've been lucky enough to, you know, I've worked with Profoto. I work with Bowens. I work, you know, currently working with Ellen Chrome. Um, Ellen Chrome needs to make speed lights. I, I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've told them it's, it's a, uh, I mean, when Profoto made this, this A1, I mean, this, right, I got one right here. When mm. they made this, changed everything. The fact that I could just seamlessly integrate this into a studio setup or the rechargeable battery, a clean light. I mean, one thing Ellen Chrome has mm. is it's, you ask anyone who shot with Ellen Chrome, the first thing out of the mouth is it's so clean. Like the mm. light is just clean. Uh, and and Rotolux, like some of the best modifiers on earth have been, Rotolux modifiers that mm -hmm. that um inverted octa the uh the indirect octa yep. where you actually put the light backwards so it hits and then bounces this way yep. you cannot find a more beautiful soft light out there than that soft it's um fucking believable if you yep. if ellen chrome just had a speed light i would use it as a commander mm -hmm. and i would just you know throw it into play because we actually got a chance to use the new ellen chromes that they put out yep. and uh i think they're pretty good for the money and mm -hmm. the light is stupid clean, stupid mm -hmm. clean. Also, your flash duration was surprisingly fast. Yeah, I've used them. I haven't used them enough to have an opinion on them. I just they just worked when I when I <laughs> use them. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, you know, I kind of, you know, it'll take me a while to like bring them into kind of like daily use. You know, I have them here in my apartment. I'll probably be doing like some demos and things like that with them. Um, yeah. But I, I use everything. I use Profoto. I use Godox. I use Ellen Chrome. Like, I really love the Ellen Chrome ELB 500 because I like the fact that you can boom it easier and the assistant can hold it longer. Um, yeah, I, love I think it, that's a luxury, though. When you can use multiple systems, that's kind of a luxury because usually you're investing into one. If you're a <laughs> hobbyist, you're kind of going, all right, I got to make some decisions here and only so many things are going to talk to so many other things. 
And uh, it's it, it, one of the things that drove me crazy was making Nikon speed lights match studio lights. Cause you know how they're bluer, like speed lights tend to have like a colder after shade. Yep. Oh, it drove me nuts forever. It, it just mm -hmm. drove me crazy. Especially in low power, it, the color can fluctuate a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Hey, what were you doing on that Annie Leibovitz set anyway? Were you working for Pro Photo at that time? Yeah, I was working for Pro Photo and I was doing behind the scenes stills. Nice. Nice. Um, and we had a, a, another gentleman I worked with, Matt Hill. He was in this other got kid who used to be an intern of ours, Max. They were shooting like all the BTS video. All right, and then cool, I was man. doing like the BTS still. So it was, yeah, it was cool seeing her work. Yeah. I mean, if you want to know who's a, a true beast is, I mean, may she rest in peace, Mary Ellen Mark. Okay. I had a chance to produce a shoot with Mary Ellen Mark. We were doing, um, you talk about someone who likes to keep it like all natural, you know, we're doing a shoot out in Thompson, not Thompson Square Park. What's the, it's in the Lower East Side, the park. Washington? Not Washington Square Park. Um, it's almost like on like by Avenue A and B. Uh, Cooper, Cooper, uh, no, oh. is it Thompson? No, it's not Thompson Square Park. Tompkins is the Lower East Side. Maybe it is Thompson Square Park. We were doing a shoot with Mary Ellen Mark there, and she was clearly, you know, 20 years older than everyone. She must have been in her 70s when we were doing this shoot. She did not stop. All the assistants were tired. Everyone was tired. Her husband, the video team was tired. She did not stop. I remember people were complaining that they were getting hungry. And she said, you can get snacks, but we're not having a meal. God damn. How, what, when was this? This was probably 2000, probably about maybe two years before she passed away. So I want to say it was maybe 2000, uh, 2011, 2012, oh. somewhere around there. Okay. I, wow, that's I was wild. Saying, I got to show you the uncut interview, which is amazing. What, what was she shooting that she got so sucked into it? She was shooting portraits of the Halloween animal parade, the Halloween dog costume contest that's in Thompson Square Park. She was shooting portraits of like the animals and sometimes with their owner, but it was mostly wow. the animals. And these are like that's amazing portraits of dogs. Really? Uh, we actually have someone in our little community here who does nothing but dog portraits and she would have been psyched to hear about this so maybe we'll find a link for it and put in the discord that way you guys can like munch on it for a little while we'll get him in the discord so we can keep this constantly going cool. um is there anything you're like like looking to work on like is there some like i know you look like you're constantly trying to figure out another level to doing something crazy with lighting mm -hmm. so i'm wondering is there just like some mountain you haven't reached are you bored yet i mean I'm too impatient and just like fast forward as fast as I can. Mm -hmm. I feel like I get over a shoot before I even pick up the camera. I'm just kind of like, all right, I got to get through this one. <laughs> then I got to go to the next one. Mm -hmm. you, are you like looking to do something huge or? Um, I'd love to. One of the shoots that I want to do really bad this year is like a group shot of like a bunch of like burlesque performers on location. Okay. Um, just I want something. Yeah, I want to do a shot in which basically I get to play with like a lot of different personalities. That's very um, cool. I have, you know, one of my good friends is Angie Pontani who put together like the New York um, burlesque festival and her husband's Brian Newman, who's Lady Gaga's um, band leader. Jesus. Um, and when we shoot, it is just so fun. You know, I did it. There's a shoot on my Instagram with them. Yeah, um, it was fun. And they, it's like a, you'll see like a couple in a bathtub and then oh, just, yeah. start where they're like in the bed. Let me, uh, I, oh man. My, but I'd love to do like a shoot where it's just like a ton of different kind of like nightlife performers doing like some awesome like group shot, either like in a theater. So it's over here. Yeah, those, those shots. Yep. Man. Those are some animated people. Well, I'll tell you what, if you need an extra hand or an assistant 
I'm there, buddy. If it's in New York. And if you scroll up, there's another, you just passed it. If you're right, there's another set of them where they're like in a bed. There, yeah, those like those portraits there. And so there's actually like back in that lamp, I believe I have like a speed light. In here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we did when we did this big hands-on uh, thing, me and Daniel, is mm -hmm. we had a light that we were trying to balance outside light with inside light. Well, outside light with strobe on the inside and make it look like it was nighttime outside with like CTOs on the strobes on the inside. But we didn't want to, mm -hmm. we didn't have no way to light this light that was sitting there. So we put a light here and just shot it up because you can't light air. So if we put a grid on it and it just illuminates the inside of this, yep. boom, it looked like it was on. The one thing we didn't get was this. I don't know if you see what I'm doing. Yep. With the cursor. I, I totally yeah. see it. That yeah, total arc. We totally didn't get that. So if you looked at it close enough and you knew what lighting was about, you'd have been like, oh, that's fake as fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's kind of the thing, right? Is you get to a point where you notice lighting so tight that when you go to create it, there's no um, there's no escape hatch for your viewer to go like, ah, this is, this is set up light, like, man, whatever. You're, once you take them out of the moment that you're trying to create, you kind of lost it. You know, that's where the, mm -hmm. a successful image is about creating light that's believable. So I don't, let me ask you how you feel, because I talk to Vanessa about this all the time. Yep. How do you feel about these people that shoot super flat light, then burn it in in post, make it look like a fucking painting, mm -hmm. and still call it a photo? I... You know, they sculpt in the shadows, yeah. they sculpt in the light theory. It's like... It, it ends up to me being more of an illustration than it is a photograph. You know, it, to That's, me, it, 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 it's no longer about like painting with light. Um, it's no longer about photography. It's more about, you know, I almost feel the same way when, you know, you see someone like if you and I were having this chat and I decide to have like a filter where I got unicorns running around my head and like <laughs> smooth skin and, you know, you know, I, I, I'm personally not a fan for it. Um, but I'm yeah. also, if I'm also like, you know, if that I, I never totally discount a photographer that I see is constantly still learning. So if I see someone got there and they just stopped and they're just like, this is my thing. I'm just like, wow, it's so short-sighted. And there's so many other ways that you could get there that could look better. You should at least short experiment. Short-sighted is a good way to put it. But if I think it's a photographer who's constantly learning, so that, that I guess there's a little prejudice involved and like that's where they're at right now. Yeah. And they're open to like, okay, how do I change this? How do I take, you know, because I feel like the process of like understanding what your aesthetic is, you kind of can't have any rules, you know? But then Absolutely. once you start defining the process of how you get there, um, and, and you, you, you know what, like what you want your final goal to be, like your end result, you know, then I think, uh, you know, if they're, if they're about growing, I, I went way off your question, <laughs> it's fine, go. Say, like i i personally don't have any prejudice to the way someone learns okay you know and if that's part of their process and learning then have at it you know i think that they need to be open to adjusting their aesthetic to possibly like even take their goal further you know that's interesting um, i think i'm just too full of hate and frustration I mean, I literally just look at something and they, if, so you know what drives me crazy is when they make the eyes look like they're illuminated. And it's like, there's no way those eyes are illuminated, especially if like one of the half of the face is in shadow and somehow this eye matches this eye's exposure. You're not looking at it as a photographer when you're editing. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what bothers me. So if you want to call it a digital illustration or whatever you want to do, go for it. But when they, when they call it a photo, I can't, I just can't. And, and I think that if you are to edit your images, at least understand how light acts so that I don't feel like you're kind of lying to me when I'm looking at an image. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Am I crazy? I mean, I don't know. I, I just, I, I think you, you hit it on the head with the, the way you wrap that up. And I, I share your opinion and I do call bullshit. If I feel like someone's producing an image like that and their goal is to like fool me, <laughs> you know, or they're, or they like, it's, how do I say it? Like, like I've done a lot of bad retouching on the behalf of clients and they just wanted it that way. 
<laughs> but that's <laughs> you know? an ill-informed client. Don't you think that's ill-informed? Ill-informed or very vain? Because sometimes it's individuals and they're just like, well, I just want it to look like that. Make my okay. way too small, make this that small. And so you I know why they want that? Is because they saw another photographer put it work out like that. Yeah. So no, I, I do hate it. Cause I no, I, I I do hate it. I'm being too nice just because <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think about it, man. I am just like, yeah, it does make me cringe a little bit, you know. I, I guess I'm being safe because I've done it sometimes and I make myself cringe. I'm just like, do you really want this? You know, like it's yeah. it's almost like when you see like that that parent in the grocery store and it's the middle of <laughs> April and their kid has on a Halloween costume, you're just like <laughs> like okay I get it like it was just easier for you to get them dressed that way you know <laughs> but if, like if, if they want to do that every single day I'm not going to say there's a problem there but it's like okay what are you what are you trying to solve for you know yeah that's... so it is I, I do hate bullshit retouching I do or yeah like, I really stuff, but I'm I'm also guilty you know I think we've all gotten to a place well you can't I'm from a school of you can't really talk shit unless you've experienced it, right? So like I, I, I've totally been through bad retouching in my early days because I was like, I guess this is what you do. But I only assume that's what you do because that's what I saw other people doing. So mm -hmm. if you're a kid, you're 15 years old, you get your first camera or whatever, you're going after uh -huh. it, you're studying off of Instagram and that's what you see constantly. That's what you think photography is. And that becomes a goal you aspire to become and thus that ushers in a new way we do imaging, the new way of documenting. It's, to me, it's not a documentation and I don't feel like looking at it anymore. I feel like wanting to know what was in front of your lens because I'm not there. And that's why I love photojournalist guys. They can't fuck with their images and they do some amazing things out there. And for the record, if I had a kid, I'd totally make them wear a Halloween costume every day. Why not? <laughs> I want to see how fucked up I can make this kid. No, I'm just kidding. Have you but, done a lot of photojournalism? Uh, not, not in the last like decade, as soon as I got into the makeup industry, um, I got so busy there and I got so excited going forward with it that I let go of anything of the moment. If that, does that make sense? Like, like go rush to do this, go grab that. There was, there was a lot of times I remember I was getting called by local papers cause there was a time that they were, um, the Gilgo beach murders were happening. Mm -hmm. And they were like trying to send photographers to go capture when they were pulling out these bodies. And I remember two bodies got found or whatever. And I was like, oh, I missed it. Someone got it else, uh, whatever. I got six calls because I kept on finding another body and another body to go out there to go shoot. And I kept mm -hmm. on turning it down because it would have cost me more money to get all the way out to Long Island than I would have made to, to shoot. And then that's when I guess I turned it more monetary instead of like, I want to do this. But in the end, if the job doesn't, leave you with a positive why would you want to do it right mm -hmm. so I, I guess i just left photojournalism um back in like my heavy film days uh and and also it just seemed like there was less respect for it every day mm -hmm. i mean look at the new was it daily news or new york times there's not one staff photographer anymore yeah i think i think it's just the way people are um digesting images like i got into photography wanting to do photojournalism um yeah i think we all did right like you want to document what's around you absolutely and i it's to this day i still have the most fun it's it's just surprising most of my most journalistic images are now on <laughs> on my on my phone Hell yeah you know and I'm with I, you. I do get upset at all the correction that apple puts on it you know i mean the the they're automatically yeah. cleaning up skin. They're taking like, you can have like a five stop exposure difference and like your phone will just be like, you know, like it won't it's be perfect, ugly, but it's, it's just everything's so smooth, you know, the colors suck. Am, am I the only one that thinks this? But every time I do video with my phone, I'm like, this is the most oversaturated GoPro looking shit I've ever seen. It's horrible. <laughs> it's so bad, man. It's horrible. And, and the worst is when you have like a client who does it and then you're shooting like everything log, oh. you know, and they're going back and like, look what I got on my phone. And you're just like, it, it actually looks really good. And we may not even have the dynamic range to get the shot to look like <laughs> what you just got. And you get, pissed. you know, it, it's that, that pissed me. I, I, I am like a, 
you know, I am like the grumpy old man of my friend, and that's what I'm trying of my friends, and that's what I'm trying not to be because I'm such a I'm such a traditionalist. Like when I hear people like say like, oh, you don't need. So now I'll go into my like mad rapper moment, right? You got me there. You got me there. You, you like you pulled it out. Like when people are talking about like, oh, you know, maybe you don't need a big sensor. Maybe you just need like, uh, you know, you don't need full frame, you know? And yeah. then it's like, have you ever seen what like F5.6 looks like on an eight by 10 view camera? I, I actually, yeah. Um, it, oh no, I don't have it anymore. Uh, yeah, it's I a do. different type of depth of field. You know, and like the larger chip that you get, your depth of field looks different on different lenses. Like I just shot with. Um, but that's because of perspective, because you're actually stepping closer. It's 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 a misconception that the sensor, the size of the sensor is doing it. It it's a it's a misconception. But ultimately, if I put if I put the two pictures up, if you oh see, no, you'll see it. Yeah. And, and for me, that's the that's what it boils down to. You know, Don't worry, I got you. We'll do four by five. I'll, we'll shoot. Let's we'll um, shoot four by five. Let's do it. Done. It's a beautiful, yeah. how beautiful is that. Boom. Euclid Public Schools. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, I hear you. I totally hear you. And 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 for me, that's where like I become less technical because it's just like everyone can talk to their blue in the face saying, "Oh, it really doesn't matter. It's all these other factors that are what's changing." And you're like, well, all those different factors give you a completely different image. And no matter how hard you try, you're not going to get a shallow eight by 10 depth of field look on a micro four thirds camera. It's just not going to happen. You know, For me, it's noise. It's the noise factor that gets me like I can't mm -hmm. when I see something on micro four thirds, I right away. First of all, the ratio is very awkward to me. Mm -hmm. And the noise gets boosted up like twice over at least just because there's that much pixels jammed on that smaller of a plane. It's what happens, you know, um, full frame to me has been like the way and people always be like, oh, APS-C. Yeah, there's reasons for APS-C and there's times for it. And there's like you need that extra false zoom of the crop sensor and stuff. I mm -hmm. get it. Or the faster processing, right? If you are shooting sports and you want to get. I get it. But wait till the day that medium format and the processors get powerful enough to make medium format full frame. We have cameras that feel like the size of a full frame camera that have medium format sensors. That could be the next standard if they get it fast enough and the price down. Yeah, it, and, and I think it'll cut, because I used to work with Leaf America too, with, with, on their digital backs. And yeah, it, I just, I feel like it'll, I feel like the demand will never be there um, just because people will never really understand like the benefits, you know, medium format just looks, I remember the Mamiya 7 with a 65 millimeter lens is my favorite portrait lens ever on the planet. It's so beautiful. Like really? it's, it's sharp and it's just beautiful. Mamiya 7 with a 65 millimeter to this day, if I had to walk around with one camera and one camera only, like for the rest of my life. A digital version of that would be pretty amazing. A Mamiya you know? Seven, that's crazy. I mean, I, have, I actually have a Mamiya Six Four Five AFD right here, um, I mean, I but I was well. never into these lenses. They never were that super sharp for me. I was never really. I have a Hasselblad though that I really like the glass on, but mm -hmm. focusing on a Hasselblad and trying to be fast is. <laughs> it's yeah. just it's just not happening. But there's something to be said for the characteristics of the gear, what the glass does, not just, is it sharp? Mm -hmm. Not just, is it fast glass? But does it give you the color you want? Does it give you the tonality you want? The, the color space that happens inside of a lens is something you can't match. When kids try to tell me, oh, I have a Leica lens on my Sony. Yeah, well, that Leica lens isn't gonna shoot like a Leica lens now because <laughs> there's, a, there's a reason that the sensor and processor are geared for the color space that's happening inside that glass. And I don't think people get that. You know, it's it's a it's a lot to understand, and some people don't need to. But I think that the moment, how do I say it? Like, the, the, I think of photography almost like um, like a doctor, right? Some people are going to give themselves stitches their whole lives, or you know, like <laughs> self medicate, and let them do what they want to do. But once once people are hiring you, 
Yeah. I feel like in order to keep the importance of what we do, it, it is being able to approach a job and not have your client have to sacrifice because you don't know what you're doing. You Bingo. know, if your client asks like, hey, can we do this? Your answer should, if, if it's possible, you should say yes. You know, like if you're a doctor, you should be able to heal people given different circumstances and you should be constantly practicing. You know, I like that term, you know? And I think as a photographer, you owe it to your peers to keep advancing this thing so that, you know, camera manufacturers can have a reason to come out with a medium format camera that kicks ass. Cause right now all of them are like a little bit slow. Like they can invest in that technology yeah. that will advance our art because more people understand the significance of it. You know, I feel like when I hear a lot of photo education now, it's all based upon telling people who are coming to you to learn something what they want to hear, which may not actually be the right thing. And, you know, when we started doing this show with Sakonic, everybody was just like, this is too advanced. This is too complicated. Um, can you please do more basic education? Can you please do this? And what I want to tell people is like, there's <laughs> so much basic education out there. Yep, absolutely. That everybody is trying to give, teach you like the path of least resistance, you know? But the golden stuff you want to hear. Yeah. The, 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 what you're going to learn by having some things that pose a little resistance mm -hmm. is going to be huge. Like people don't like learning the inverse square law, right? And I don't think as a teacher, you should start with the inverse square law. I think you should start by telling someone like, guess what? And you know this because you shot on the Speedatron. If you wanted to dial a Speedatron back a tenth of a stop, you had to move the light back. Yeah, yeah. There was no dial. You actually had to go like three inches. Got it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and so after you teach someone the basic concept that if I move a light, it's going to get dimmer on my subject. Mm -hmm. Then after that, you simply want to tell them, okay, this is how I can prove that. If, if, you, want to, if you want to understand how it affects exposure then this is like the the equation that satisfies that you know yeah and you have to do it then actually solidify why it happened uh, it, no one's going to learn the inverse square law and then apply it but they will go light something and change it as they're shooting it now we have to understand why that happened yep and and like yeah. and this is i start out with still life like professionally you know my biggest you know my biggest clients were hoboken floors they were at one time the largest flooring manufacturer in the United States. And it was about lighting floors. You know, we had to, another company I shot for was, do you ever get like little plastic binders and the little spiraling clips that attach at the end? There's a company I shot for, that's all they did. And we just shoot beautiful shots of spiral bindings for their annual reports. And Insane. when you have a shot set up and it's perfect, Right. You don't want to move anything, but let's say now you need to you need to get you need to shoot that at F22 instead of F5.6. But when you're shooting still life, when you start moving things around, you're changing your catch lights, you're changing like where your highlights fall. And so sometimes you need to know technically how can I keep this shot exactly the way it is but get more depth of field? Do I need to use focus stacking? Do I need to just open up the aperture you know early on you know with digital cameras like the mamiya that you had there mm -hmm. if you shot that on a digital sensor at like f16 it just didn't look sharp no it doesn't no you know but if you shot it on film it actually did, would look sharp you know but digital once you got past that and so that's where people who like don't want to hear the technique and don't want to like learn all the technical stuff it's it's like cooking. If you know those rules, you can make food so much better. Yeah. You know? And I think people, they want to hear a way to just go, give me ABC. I will take that. And now I will recreate ABC. So that's why they get stuck on things like Rembrandt lighting. Everyone makes fun mm -hmm. of me because I, I scream and shout, like, shut the fuck up about Rembrandt. <laughs> uh -huh. Because you're not shooting. You're not. Mm -hmm. You're trying to replicate a shadow pattern on any subject. Not 
a lighting pattern that you think would work for a subject. You're just trying to regurgitate something you saw someone else do instead yep. of approaching it from actually shooting. And one of the issues we're having with gear being created that we might want is because the application is no longer there. We want a medium format because we want to shoot billboards, publications, print. And now everything's going to your phone and people are going to tell me, well, what difference does it make if going like this, it still looks like shit. So they not, they're not going to see any valid reason to give us the higher end versions of what we want out there. And as far as there being education for people beyond beginner or basic education, mm -hmm. there's people that actually want that because they're tired of seeing this plug and play method. They're trying to find the gaps between here's technique A, here's technique B, but like, I'm trying to do something around here, but that's because you didn't learn what made A and what made B. You didn't mm -hmm. learn about the, the elements of it to create your own technique, you, and that's the problem. You, you hit it on the head. Part of, part of a teacher's responsibility is to, actual te to actually teach people how to learn. You know, And like what you said is just like, yeah, if, I, if you just learn how to copy exactly what I did, the way that I did it, you're going to come to me now to ask, okay, now how do I get to the next step? You know, and I think as a teacher, if you can teach someone the value of learning by going on more of a journey than just putting it in the microwave and be like, okay, it's done. <laughs> you're, you're teaching them to like develop a style. You're teaching them to have an opinion. Style and not just trust in the way you do things. You know, like there's so many people who wanna, like the painted background I have here, there's so many people who wanna use it because Andy Leibowitz uses them. You know, but before Andy Leibowitz, Irving Penn was using them way back in the day. And before Irving Penn was using them, people were just using them so that they had some type of backdrop behind their, um, behind their subjects. Yeah. You know, and I think like Irving Penn, he started out just using like a, almost just like a curtain, like kind of like a theatrical curtain. And then, you know, it built into like these, you know, distress painted backdrops, which like, you know, Patrick Demarchier was using. And then Annie Leibovitz, you know, kind of jumped on board, you know? Yeah. I mean, she's, if you look at her career, she is a master of um, looking at other people's work and making it her own, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, I mean, you have to have a point of view. You need a point mm -hmm. of view. Yeah, I yeah. won't say what photographer it was, but I was in a photographer studio who <laughs> was somewhat legendary, meaning who could talk shit about Annie Leibovitz. And she, they had examples of shots that she copied, almost like one for one, you know? Jesus. Like that thing, yeah, that, I'm, I'm trying not to name anything specifically as not to, to call the person <laughs> out, but... Um, but, but that happens. I mean, that totally happens every day. Oh, absolutely. And I'm not against that. There's, I get inspiration from looking at a ton of people's work. I'm just like, like on Instagram, I have an entire folder of pictures that were natural light. You know, because I want to do a, a whole video series on replicating sunlight. Okay. You know, and so like the one I just showed you is like a part of that. But I want to have it be like an entire like 10 part series. That's nuts. It's crazy yeah. how far you can go with it too. You know, people think that I want to make it look like it's sunlight. Okay. So put the flash outside and put it through a window and somehow it's sunlight. And there's like way more to it than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you have to care about it. You have to care about those subtle things that make it different. Creating the shadows to be blue like you did is caring about that detail. Yeah. You, 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 yeah, and, and to me, that's the fun part, man. It, it's, it's, it's getting to the point so all that becomes like muscle memory. Like, I, I remember I talked to Joe McNally probably five years ago, you know? And we, we wanted to do something with Joe McNally and Sakonic, you know? And he was like, look, man, honestly, I just don't, I'm paraphrasing now, but he's like, I don't really use a light meter. You know, he's like, yeah. there, are, there are situations in which I would use one and I own one, but it's just not going to be realistic me to, telling someone that they need a light meter, you know, or like Greg Heisler. I did an interview with Greg Heisler, um, who's genius, by the way. Like, you can look up old Greg Heisler interviews. They're, they're like, really, really good. Um, yeah. One day, me, you, and Daniel should get together, and I should show you guys, like, some uncut, like, you were, just raw interviews that are, like, so dude, dope. 
you were supposed to come to our studio and it just got we just got fucked over i mean right. damn right where are you exactly you're in brooklyn i'm in brooklyn but my studio you know manhattan beauty supply the manhattan wardrobe supply you know that building no oh uh, it's i'm right i'm on 29th i'm like oh. right there in chelsea so uh we're 10 blocks from adorama so we would work at uh the event space do something there mm -hmm. then we go to the studio and do more there i mean uh and we have that 12th floor balcony it's amazing i mean it, it i could not have it's funny you say this because i <laughs> so my one of my studios before this one was mm -hmm. painted matte black head to toe matte black you controlled every aspect of light mm -hmm. and that studio really is what dialed me in of like I couldn't just drag my shutter to get ambient to come in. I had to mm -hmm. make something happen on my own. Now we got this all white studio with these amazing windows. And now I spend more time blocking out the light from coming in that goddamn studio and still creating the light. Mm -hmm. Then I'm like, what am I in this place? <laughs> Why am I in this place, man? So you gotta, I don't know. It was, I don't even know why I brought that shit up, but it's, no, uh, it, has, it has a, it has a romance to it. Like when you walk in, you see this beautiful light, but then the moment you have to fight against it, Oh God! And you're just like man, what what would your dream space be like if you could pick like? Ross, your, like, I mean, just every I want every wall to be fucked up and different. I just want infinite possibilities. And when you have an all white space, well, I only need one corner to be white. Maybe the next one can be exposed brick, and then beyond that, we have a rusted metal door or whatever else, you know, there's so it, the one thing I can't stand about my special effects shots is that they're always sterile and stagnant because they're in a studio. And the only thing I can really do is put them on a black background and make that black background, some sort of atmosphere. But beyond that, what are you going to do when you're shooting a fucking alien? Where are you going <laughs> to, what are you, what are you going to do? Right. Uh -huh. uh, or that Popeye makeup. I say all the time, if I, if I had, an actual shoot with a Popeye makeup and not shot at a trade show, I would have put him on, I would have found an old tugboat or something and put him on there and made it a whole environment, but you can't. But if I had a shooting space, dude, it would be like all fucked up old glass. One could be um, stained glass. Another one could be like old dingy warehouse glass. Then I got the wood floor. I got some mm -hmm. crazy ceilings, like just complete grime and psychoticness. I could go forever, but instead commercial land goes we need clean we need precise we need it now and that's where i ended up steering my career so i'm kind of like this grimy guy that scraped up all this crap and just started <laughs> trying to be like clean but mm. i'll never be i'll never be clean aesthetic but i'll be clean technical till the day i die like i cannot stand sloppy fucking technicals mm. on my in my because i know how to fix it and i'm how many times you looked at a shot and you're like am i just fucking you know with the extra little, yeah. So windows or no windows? Oh man, I would do windows, but I'd have to be able to black them out just in case. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, yeah, you always get psyched on. I think every time I walk in the studio, I'm like, oh, the light here looks beautiful, but like, I'm trying to do this shot. <laughs> so, so like, I can't deal with this shears or the north light or whatever shit that people do. Mm -hmm. I, uh, man, yeah. I, you always want the option for daylight, but I think you always want to be able to cancel it out as well. Like how many times have you just had to fight the exposure in the room more than anything mm -hmm. and it puts you in a corner or you're maxing out your lights so you can close down your aperture more or you're putting an ND filter on your camera and then you're stressing out your lights even more yep. because that's the thing. Cameras need to go back in ISO. Forget this high ISO <laughs> shit. Uh -huh. Give me like eight ISO. Give me like, um, like paper negative ISO. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. And and let me know what L is. I hate when they just put like ISO L and I have to guess that it's like 50, you know? It's, first of all, if you put it on L, you're handicapping your exposure. You're taking away half of your dynamic range easily by falsifying the sensor to be underpowered. No one talks about that though, right? They just think mm -hmm. the lower they go, the cleaner the shot. Okay, when your highlights are blown and gone, you let me know what the fuck happened there, genius. It's just digitally <laughs> doing it for you. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. I, I guess I'm, it's where if you're shooting JPEG and you just really need it to be that lower, you know? Like I you need the camera to do that for you. 
I don't know. I never understood that. And there's times when we do like open shoots with like civilians and they bring their super expensive camera, but they don't know what they're doing. And mm -hmm. it's set on low and they just go, oh, but it's cleaner that way. I'm like, actually, it's not. You're actually screwing it up. Just kind of like people think images get sharper, the tighter the, uh, the aperture. But mm -hmm. there's a point where light splits and stops being sharp. And people don't talk about that either, right? You know? And, and, I, and so it gets back to the point we we're making earlier. Like, if you're the type of student where the, the professor just tells you put it on L because that gets you lower noise or whatever, you should go back and you should shoot it at every single usable ISO. Mm. And you should make that decision for yourself of like where you like, because you may actually want a little noise. Like I don't like, like the Canon, what, the 5DS or the 50D or whatever the 50 megapixel one is. Yeah, yeah. 5DSR? 5DSR, yeah, the R. Something I like hate that. the file. I feel like it gets, it, it's super sharp. Like it'll be like, like your tattoo will look amazing. And then it'll get to a section of your forehead and it'll be like mashed potatoes. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm I don't you. understand how this piece over here looks so soft and manufactured. And then this over here looks sharp as, as a tack. You know? So when I did the beta for the D850, it's mm -hmm. a 47 megapixel sensor. So I went from, the, from a 36 to that, but they handed me this camera and I was like, ah, so what? It's more resolution, right? And I said, what's the big fucking deal? It was more resolution and it was cleaner. And I was mm. like, what the fuck? And then the color felt correct. It wasn't warm in the highlight. Like it wasn't, it didn't have that weird gradation. Mm -hmm. There wasn't one aspect of the image that felt like it fell apart. And that's when I said, I got to buy this camera. I threw it on three credit cards mm -hmm. and I was like, I need this fucking camera. And I haven't let it go for since this is the same camera this is the first camera by the way i didn't trash like i still have the first Dude. one and, and um it's it's because i get a lot of like grime in my cameras i chuck them i if anyone watches me when i shoot i mm -hmm. throw my lights everywhere i don't give a fuck it's pro gear it can handle it That's i, I want to do a video showing behind the scenes of what you're doing on these videos because i remember when i went to i saw you at adorama i don't think people understand like you're running the chat. You're changing the lighting. You're changing the cameras. Like yeah. thinking on your feet, like it's just built in. And that's the same thing as like for, as a photographer, you need to approach a shoot with is that you're jumping on grenades, putting out fire. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jumping on grenades. Have, if you didn't have a grasp of the technology or like what's going on, you couldn't do any of that. You no. know, like. I had a teacher once, uh, Susan Dooley at Nassau Community College, and she told me uh, the first second I met her, she said, I don't care what your ego is or what awesome shots you think you took, 90% of photography is problem solving. And you're going to get out there and you're going to get punched in the face before you know it. And if you can't make something happen, you're not a photographer. And I was like, huh, like it really isn't about your ego or what you can do. It's more about how can you deal with what's in front of you and get the best possible solution? Because that's what we always talk about. Like, what's the solution? I think we hear that all the time when we're talking on set is mm -hmm. solution, solution, solution. And I don't think people realize that. And it's all the years of experience of having dealt with variants of the same problem that get you to a faster solution. And I think the people that are able to not only react, but put out the fire fast to save the time to give you more of a window so that you can get more out of the shot or the shoot itself is what keeps your career alive. It's, it's what makes your clients comfortable that they hired you, that you created a product, that there was no fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fail, failure's not an option. There's a, man, there's a great, I used to watch, um, on HBO used to have this show about um, like football team training camps. I think they still have it, you know? And there was this quarterback who got cut and he went in to talk to the coach and he said, coach, like, I'm making all my completions. I'm doing good. Like I'm having a great training camp. Why are you guys cutting me? You know, like, I think you guys should give me like a few more reps. And the coach said, I'll be honest with you. When I put you with an amazing wide receiver, you look amazing and they look amazing and you're killing it. When I put you with a chicken shit wide receiver, guess what? They still look like a chicken shit wide receiver. <laughs> he was like, I want a quarterback who can make chicken shit look like chicken salad. Jesus. And as a photographer, I feel like you have some photographers out there who, if you give them a beautiful model, great hair and makeup, it's going to look gorgeous. 
if you give them like the perfect sunset on a well-balanced landscape, it's going to look beautiful. You know, if you, what, if you give them ideal conditions, it's going, they're going to come up with amazing work. And I feel like a lot of fine art photographers, I shouldn't use that because I know I'm going to get some flack over it, but <laughs> I feel like you have two types of photographers out there. And you need to define early on whether or not you want to find your vision as it already exists, meaning like your photography is about like access and like aesthetics, you know, and you look for it and your lifestyle enables you to do that. Um, and when you see an image, it's what you were envisioning and you know how to capture it. But then you have other photographers and we, like myself, I would say in 80 or 90 percent of the work I have to do, I need to be able to create an image. I can't just spend my time searching the street looking for it. Right. I need to be able to create it, you know, and that's where you need to learn and understand a lot of different techniques like mixed martial arts, you know, like early on people started out with just one technique. And then they started to see the failures. Like, well, if you just study kickboxing, well, you need some grappling skills too, you know. But if and if you're a grappler, you're gonna have to have some stand up as well, you know. Like, if you want to be a photographer who is competing, either creatively, you need to really be able to find your vision. So, for for instance, these guys who shoot for like National Geographic, they understand animals. They understand. Yeah like the migration patterns, they understand when they're going to be mating, they understand when they're going to be hunting, like they understand these animals. And that's the technical side of the photography that they do, you know, and they build little custom rigs. I remember, you know, before we had drones and all these crazy sliders, I was watching behind the scenes of these guys doing this shot showing how big um, that like shit piled up, you know? <laughs> Okay. And so they built like this whole custom, like, what do you call it? Like a, a zip line, basically. Yeah. At, at the top of this pile of shit that came all the way down to give you like the perspective of like how big and enormous it was, you know? Um, now you can buy something like that from a, fo from a photo place yeah. for like a hundred bucks. You get like a, some type of zip line with a motor. It's crazy. Exactly. But, but, you know, to get there, they, they had to know the migration patterns of these bats. They had to look at the weather. They had to know all the habits of this animal or creature, you know? Yeah. Well, that's uh -huh. kind of, we just had Jamie Price on the Adorama Facebook Live. And he's like, yeah, I know every track better than I know the driving. Like, I need mm -hmm. to know where to be. And he, he can show you any track in the world. And he shot it and he figures it out. But I don't think you... Uh, I feel like you can totally see the difference in a shot when you're connected to the subject. When I shot BMX, I rode and lived BMX. I knew what was important to shoot or how to portray it. But then there's also like boudoir photography. We talked, me and Dan talked about this and I'm not a big fan of all that stuff, mm -hmm. but I could totally see a woman's shot and a man's shot and see the difference in them. And I feel like I've always liked female photographers' perspectives on boudoir photography, mainly because I think they're looking at it as an aesthetic rather than an attraction. Mm -hmm. And I think I see that more. And I, and I, even without knowing who the photographer was, if I, if I gravitated to one style of shot or not, it ended up being like a female boudoir photographer. And I think it's something to be said that you have to feel a connection. Like they're aware of what a woman might feel insecure about and might want to highlight to make it feel like a more amazing for them. Like you can sense that if you don't feel a connection, um, Joe McNally, you talk to that dude he'll remember every name of every person he's ever shot with that in his entire career. And it's like, how, how I can't remember my mailman's name. Are you out of your fucking mind? Like mm -hmm. I have no idea, dude, but that's the difference between good photographers and great legends. I feel is being connected to what you're shooting to care about it to a level that you put all the effort in that you build your own ambition for it. And it's um, one of the reasons I went all in on special effects. People were spending, you know, $500 to $5,000 on these makeups and shooting them like a fucking joke. It mm -hmm. looked like a Party City catalog. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? Like, how cool is this? 
And then whenever someone brings in an alien, I'm always like, so what kind of living conditions are they in? Is it a dry desert or is they like a swamp type creature? Like, mm -hmm. what does it eat? Does it have intelligence? Is it wearing clothes or is it primal? Like, does it have the, a thought process or is it an animal? Uh, does it even understand where it is? Is it blind because it lives in the darkness? Should it feel like it's hearing to see? That's where you start seeing the gestures and the mannerisms when I shoot that stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's super... It's, there's actually a book. Have you? There's a photographer, Roy Dick Robin. Roy what? Roy Dick. I mean, I can never pronounce his name right. Roy Dick Robin. He has a book um, that he did with Langston Hughes called "The Sweet Fly Paper of Life." Okay. And I think it's the best photo book. Do I have a copy of it around here? Sweet what? Fly what? The Sweet Fly Paper of Life. I'm trying to see. Sweet Fly Paper. Uh, and okay. it, it's um. It's it's images of you know kind of like the struggle of like Let me see you know, African Americans in Harlem, and the images are so honest. It it doesn't you know what you were just saying about like you know when women shoot boudoir photography it can look different than when men shoot it. Um, you know I think that can happen for two reasons. I think depending on like the attitude and perspective of the model, you know if she if she's going to act different. Yes, that's the book. Uh, I don't know if I can find any images on here. Oh, all uh, of them. I'm mean, look at the one on the bottom of the the, the woman. Yeah, that's trying to the find book. the actual photos. If you go back, some of the yeah, I think like the photos in this book are so unbelievably honest. Yeah, you know, like look at the the gentleman on the bottom right hand corner, right? Right here. The photographer's not even there. You know, if I see one more picture of someone who travels like a third world country and it's just like, you know, this crinkly face staring into a camera, you know? Yeah, they're this like moment of like savior or something or you're supposed to like awe in their poverty or something. And I'm just kind of like, I'm good. Like, but the pictures is... in this book are are so honest, you know, and they're just like these slices of life and you know, it has poetry by, by Langston Hughes. This book is like, is any photographer, if you want to look at like completely honest pictures, even the printing, like it's printed with no ego. You know, I mean, it, none of the pictures are given this huge amount of reverence. Um, Interesting. And, and they're still really, really powerful. It's not this photo book where it's just like, you know, this huge Tashin book, even the size of the book. I mean, this book is like, you know, five by seven almost, you know? Yeah, it's like a pocketbook. And it's the photography in it, like the way the guy's holding the baby in the upper left-hand corner, you know? Right. The yeah, photographer's not... not even there. Yeah. You know, but like- that's what, that's what puts you there though. That's the thing. Like mm -hmm. it's referential. You're there when you weren't there, you know? Mm -hmm. This is wild. Yeah, like this is like a respected portrait. You know what I mean? Like- yeah, exactly. You. And so you would know these pictures are clearly, you know, he's from there. And, and the way that people are approaching him and the access that he's given and you, you know, you're, it, they're just so honest like this. Anyone, and when you read this book and like go through the pictures, it is my favorite photo book of like all times, you know, that's wild. Yeah, and, man. Yeah, I, I just don't live a lifestyle right now that like enables me to like think and photograph, like kind of in that documentary mindset. You know, I'm I'm in a big problem solving mindset, you know? Yeah. So Yeah. I'm in commercial world. I, I'm totally like not there anymore. It's crazy to me. I I, I all my walls are covered with my life, basically. And I look at them and I'm like, where the hell did that guy go? You know, like you know, that, that dude that would break into places to get that shot or, you know, get chased out of things or, you know, I mean, there's just so much stuff. I mean, and I'm always like that. I went through it. I did it. And now I'm trying to make a life for myself with commercial means. And that's the case. The one thing I just ask of myself or pretty much any photographer is just at least do whatever you have to do your way. Mm -hmm. Don't ever just try to replicate or regurgitate really approach it as a photographer. How would I do this? And the way you do that is with a technical stack of cards you gained by learning all this stuff, yep. you know, and, and no one's ever going to have the complete deck. 
nobody. There's no way on earth anybody will have a complete deck. But if you're in it, you're in it. And if you really want it, you can have it. And the best part about it is not having the full stack. I mm. love meeting other photographers that I can super respect and go, well, I got an idea of how you did it, but I need, you know, like that's what keeps you growing and learning, I guess, you know? Uh, that being said, there is a question in the chat. Sorry, guys, I'm not ignoring you in the chat, but there was one. Any cheap trick to hack slave sensors to be more sensitive, not having to be so much in line of sight, easier to place? Um, uh, one of the, I'd say one, watch your ambient settings. If you're in straight sunlight, yeah. it's not going to see the flash as easily. I don't know. Sometimes I put the flash under shade. Like I'll put something to shade the sensor, and I think that helps. I don't know if that mm -hmm. helps you. I think you nailed it. I think controlling your ambient setting is the way to do it. But I would, the person's going to hate this answer. I would, just, <laughs> I would just buy remotes that I didn't have that problem. Radio? Yeah, meaning if I, so I look at it like this. I know the way I want to set my lights up. I know where I want to put them, right? And so I got the aesthetic part down. Now when it comes to the technical side, if this light is only firing um, half the time, I'm going to just get a different light. And I know that sounds, that sounds like, well, okay, you could afford to do that. You could do this. Think of yourself as a soldier, right? Your gun fires every third time. You're going to find a way to get a different gun. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, if someone has a piece of equipment that's really, really holding them back, you know, my advice to them is like, figure out a way to get a different piece of equipment that's not gonna hold you back. You, or change, you know, shoot with sunlight where you don't have to worry about flashes or use, con like, it, fig like that's the part where it's just like, guess what? You have to figure that part out, you know? Yeah, you have to get the equipment off your back. You can't let it be the thing that's fucking you up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I don't deal with inconsistent lights anymore. And every now and then mm -hmm. you'll luck out by seeing a new lighting pattern you didn't want to set up because something didn't fire. And you're like, oh shit, that looks even better. Mm -hmm. And you work with it. But nothing on earth is more frustrating than cheap radio triggers. You have so much, especially in New York, there's so many other wavelengths yep. that will fuck up your transmission. That's why pocket wizards are expensive is because they have a frequency that nobody else is using and they will fire. It's insane what's going on with those. I, I still have my Series 1 transceivers. I have mm -hmm. a whole set sit right there. You guys just put it back out, actually. Um, but what's the point of buying something for 60 bucks you're going to buy four times? Exactly. Or not work. Mm -hmm. And a, a radio trigger, if you do a third-party brand, could go with you for your whole career. You know, just like a good light stand will, just like anything that goes universally. You know, it doesn't matter what you shoot camera wise, yep. things go with you, you know? No, my trigger bag, my trigger bag is probably has triggers in it that are 20 years old. You yeah. Know? And, and then, the, you know, and then to, so like, so the question the person just asked is like, okay, I'm using, I'm using, the, what was the question? They're using optical yeah. triggers and they want to figure out a better way to, Get them. Get, to, they're know, probably so. having misfires because of line of sight. If it doesn't see the flash, you know, yeah. you put that strobe behind somebody and it doesn't see the initial flash or behind a wall, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes only, you actually go for it. Go for it. I don't know. Oh, no, no. I said, it, not cutting you off. Sorry, but it's the first thing is, like you said, ambient light. It, 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 there has to be some contrast there or it's not going to read it. The other part is, is more situational, meaning like, okay, let me see the room you have these set up in. And is there a way where you can have that optical trigger more visible? Yeah. You know, yeah. So like, you know, you may actually have to now change your lighting setup just a little bit. Um, Cause if, if lights aren't firing, then you're not getting What's the, the point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have, you have, you have to go with the limitations, but in, uh, so when, years ago when I did a lot of, uh, optical, mm -hmm. I bought cheaper strobes that I powered down all the way and yep. used them just as trips. So yep. if I needed a light behind that wall to fire, I put a really cheap strobe down all the way right next to me to get behind that wall to trigger that light. But then again, I could have just bought a radio trigger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, you know, there's a bunch of different ways to skin a cat. That's for sure. 
Cool, man. Yo, we just went for two hours, bro. So I'm going to give you a, a, that was, a, a break. Like 15 minutes. I know, because you talk about something you're into. But we're going to have uh, Ab on uh, Facebook Live next Friday on Facebook. So you guys can join us there. And um, we're going to get you in the Discord channel. So you, I'll set you up with your own room so you can, like, drop your videos. Yo, his videos are fucking nuts on Sakonic. I'm you, such a fan it. of them. I think they're insane. I think you nailed... The whole one, the one with the ring light uh, at, uh, turning red was just like, ah, oh, it's fucking unbelievable. I think you just nailed it. Um, definitely check those out. Uh, if you guys have any last minute questions, we'll do it. But uh, Robbie Keane is saying, I think there's a big difference between most here and pros. If you can buy an entire setup for 3000 it's tough to think about spending the same amount of money on one single light. I got gotcha. you. Uh, the base, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, everybody. Appreciate it. And you guys can watch this back. It'll be up for a while. Um, clip some stuff. Save it, right? And um, is there anything you want them to follow you on that I can put in the chat right now? Or just your Instagram? Or I Just my Instagram. Okay, I'll put that in the chat. Let me just click on it. Click, copy, and paste. Um, the question so, yeah. Join us next Friday, the 25th, I think. Yeah. And feel free, if you guys have any questions, just DM me. I try to answer like every single question I get. Yeah. And he's ridiculously experienced. It's insane. And uh, it's a total privilege to have you on our channel here, man. Thank right. you so much. I really appreciate it. We got to get into a studio and actually shoot some shit, though. Let's do some ghosts. Let's do <laughs> you, you name the day, man, and we'll figure it out. We got the studio up here. Home. We'll figure it. Your studio, like. Dude, Once this I is lifted, have, I, I want to go to Sakonic. I want to see what's up there. Like Dan said he went there and he was like, yo, you'd lose your fucking mind. I'm like, yeah, I want to go fuck with some Sakonic Ellen Chrome shit. Let's do you it. You have an open invite. Oh, I'm there, man. And we should totally think about doing a video of on whatever channel. I don't care, but I think it'll be great. I'm super excited to have you on uh, Adorama's Facebook. We got to get you like out there more. I think you're one of these hidden gems that no one's – really discovering yet because they haven't pushed the videos around enough you know well, thank you that's a, that's a huge compliment coming from yourself and, and i take oh. your tips when i ask you for how to improve them i'm trying to like you got you got a great flow man oh, like, whatever, I love dude. You, like your morning thing no i'm serious like it's not easy doing what you do like being on camera driving these conversations you know i, I just then... talk a lot <laughs> i just <laughs> You know, it's, and also it's a subject that like we lived our whole lives. You know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like it's something I'm trying to learn. Like you can tell when someone who's interviewing people are just there as someone with a microphone, like the red carpet people or whatever, those, those pretty girls to go to Comic-Con to talk to nerds and they don't know mm -hmm. anything about what they're doing, but we live this and we've been through some shitty fucking times in this industry. I think like some really tough times and we came out the other end sort of, if you want to call it that, um, <laughs> but but I will totally get you in the discord. I think you're going to have a lot of fun looking at everybody's work and dropping your, your links in there and some of your work in there as well. I, the sunset shit was just something we had to bring up. Cause I don't think people realize what goes into stuff like that. They really just think, Oh, you shot by a window. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that video, the, it's a pre-release. We may all put the link in there to the first edit. So the first edit is a little rough, but. No, it wait till it's good. done. So you get the views and the likes and the comments. You gotta, you gotta not give it away, man. You gotta get those, that engagement. When do you think that video is going to be out? I have no clue. I just did a video on like five ways to use like a soft box. Jesus. Every, everybody wanted to see that. And that one we just wrapped up this week. Um, and then I did five ways to use two one by three strip soft boxes, which if I could only use two light shapers for the rest of my life, I'd probably use one by three strips. Yeah. That's what I said too. Yeah. Dan was like three foot octane. I'm like, I get where he's coming from, from that, but like to have blades of light, you can, you really control whatever patterns you want. No, one by three strip, I think is, uh, yeah, I'm, if you give me two of those and I could do more than I could with probably two of any other light shaper. So maybe, maybe we'll pick it up there for Facebook. We'll talk about the stuff you've been doing with the light shapers. We'll talk about your preferred light shapers and no, we'll we go do. into some more stuff. We can feature that video. Okay. If you want. It's pretty, yeah. it's pretty PG, I think. <laughs> and, <laughs> And then we could talk about like some of those techniques. I love to hear something like your one light, two light techniques too. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I, I, I ever talk about like formal techniques. I just kind of like make shit go. I don't know, like I've never like gone like, I do this and this and this. Sometimes I'm just kind of like, I know that it'll do this and that's how I want it. But I also think that's part of what I dealt with. So 
the FX makeup, someone's head could be this fucking big, dude. So it's kind of like, well, I took that and I put it into shooting drag queens when they had huge wigs. You know, like I figured out some stuff. So we'll talk about that on Facebook Live. Ooh, we'll man. also talk some stuff about some meters and get some nerdness going on there. Thanks again to everybody oh, that uh, joined us. We'll have you on here again for sure. You got to come hang out. Maybe we'll get Joe it. McNally and uh, we'll do like a three, get Dan in here. We'll do like a whole photo light theory nerd chat and we'll get it going. Totally uh, thanks so much. I'll keep you on the call. We'll just end the stream and we'll figure Ooh. out the um, a couple things. Guys, thank you so much. We will see you soon. And don't forget to follow Ab and drop a comment on every one of his photos. Tell him he's <laughs> awesome. He needs it. He needs it. All right, guys, stay safe out there. Stay home. And um, I will see you Monday on Adorama's Facebook Live. All right, guys? Or probably on this channel. We got a whole week to go here. All right, don't worry about cool. it. Later, guys. Later.